Welcome to Gulf Coast Life. I'm Amy Tardif. For decades, scientists have been looking into whether the condition of the Gulf's pink shrimp can show us how Everglades restoration is doing. But funding for this type of research was cut a few years ago. Anecdotally, bait shrimpers aren't doing too well, and Gulf shrimpers say their catch isn't what it used to be. Pink shrimp were once an indicator species for Everglades restoration, but not anymore. My conversations with several researchers and shrimpers lead one to wonder, are the two related? Pink Gulf shrimp have a lot of things going for them. Scientifically, they're easy to study, says National Marine Fishery Service fishery ecologist, Dr. Joan Browder. It's a, an annual crop and as it's managed, it's not threatened with extinction or uh, it's a very sustainable fishery. And it was for many years the highest valued fishery in Florida and may be again. Browder started studying the effects of salinity and fresh water flow into the estuaries on pink shrimp growth and survival in 1984. But her research funding was cut in 2011. So she's not able to tell shrimpers if issues in the nursery habitat are related to declines in their catch. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission reports in 2006, more than 5 million pounds of pink shrimp, worth $11 million, were offloaded here on San Carlos Island. In 2013, only 2.3 million pounds of pink shrimp, worth almost half that, were offloaded. Shrimper Malcolm Curran just came in on the Polly Teresa. They were out for 23 days. He says the fleet isn't what it used to be. I think it's dwindled down from thousands of, of shrimp boats to, to hundreds in the whole Gulf, in the, the entire Gulf of Mexico. Fellow shrimper Henry Gore says the price has gone up lately, but the supply close to southwest Florida has gone down, and he doesn't know why. There haven't been any shrimp, you know, like from Sanibel. There's some there's shrimp off Sanibel, not as good as it used to be, but, but you get on a little bit south of Sanibel, and for 60 miles, it's just like it's dead. It's just, I don't know what that is. But something happened over the last 10 years. We used to catch a lot of shrimp there off Naples and all that. Nothing anymore. So Gore says he has to travel much farther south to the Dry Tortugas to make the trip worth his while. He says he faces competition from imported shrimp and 20 days of fishing costs him $18,000 in diesel fuel alone. It's a similar story for bait fisherman Ralph Woodring, who runs the bait box on Sanibel. It's got to be worthwhile to go, you know, pay for your gas and then be, be enough shrimp to, to take care of the business for the next day at least, and that's not the case. He's been trawling for shrimp and other bait fish since the 1970s. Woodring says lately his catch is not even one-tenth what it used to be. We don't count the peewees. Fifty. And he says it breaks his heart. It makes you want to cry. I have been known to on occasion. Talking to the uh, water management district some years ago and the tears just flowed. It hurts. Not far from where Woodring trawls at night, Rick Bartelson, a research scientist for the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, checks a water sample for, among other things, salinity. One of my water quality sites this year has been pretty good. The water is fresh, fresher than normal for the dry season. Bartelson is studying how seagrass beds are affected by freshwater discharges from Lake Okeechobee, runoff from the Caloosahatchee, and rainfall. When we have those high flows, salinities go way down, and they go below the, the salinity, like five parts per thousand, that shrimp uh, prefer. So, so that would account for no shrimp around our area during those discharges. But the other thing those flows do is affect the seagrasses so that seagrasses also need salinities above five parts per thousand. And when seagrasses go away, the shrimp don't have anywhere to, to hide at night when they're feeding. This is why federal fishery ecologist Dr. Joan Browder wishes she still had the funding to study pink shrimp in the estuaries. It's really important that these nursery grounds are good habitat for them with uh, good healthy seagrasses and uh, the right salinities 
at the right time and the right uh, variability so they're not stressed out and so they can grow at their maximum rates and most of them survive or a lot of them survive. Most of the funding for Browder's Pink Shrimp Studies, whose data were used to help monitor Everglades restoration, was part of a 68% cut in monitoring projects in 2011. Dr. Susan Gray, Chief Environmental Scientist at the South Florida Water Management District, says they had to scale back. While pink shrimp are important economically and for the ecosystem, they tend to be out in a band that is more saline and so not as necessarily as sensitive to changes in nearshore freshwater flows as other species. And for that reason, and because we were essentially having to make some very difficult decisions, the idea was to cut that monitoring at the time. And as economic conditions improve, we're hoping that we can go back and pick up some of these indicators. Water managers still monitor oysters, and even though oysters are more tolerant of freshwater flows than shrimp, heavy lake releases last year caused dangerously low salinity levels. As a result, all the oysters in the Caloosahatchee River, being used as indicator species for Everglades restoration, died. Dr. Gray says water managers expect to revisit the monitoring program next fiscal year. After all, without a solid plan, Florida's formerly highest valued fishery won't continue to end up in restaurants like the local in Naples. I'm cooking the shrimp with the corn. What happens is the, the shrimp sticks a little bit to the pan, which is really good. We like that flavor, and it releases some of its juice. And there it is, local Gulf shrimp with our house-made fettuccine, tomato confit, dry sherry, and tarragon. A study by the Gulf Industry Research Group, Gulf 2020, found Florida had about 1,100 golf courses in 2007. Now, many of them are closing because of the economy. The National Golf Foundation reports more than 600 golf courses across the country have closed since 2006, leaving behind huge plots of unused land. WGCU's Topher Forges visited one golf course. The Lemon Bay Conservancy is transitioning back into a more natural state. Naturalist Bob Cooper is a regular fixture at the Wildflower Preserve in Inglewood. He leads nature walks, helps with water studies, and clears the preserve of invasive plant species, including the aggressive Brazilian pepper. He says removing the pepper can be a challenge. It's a never-ending battle. Uh, there's no way we're ever going to remove all of the Brazilian pepper. About eight years ago, this plot of land looked very different. Cooper would have been standing near the eighth hole on the Wildflower Golf Course on top of meticulously treated grass and strategically plotted clusters of trees. It doesn't look at all like it. I mean, when we had the golf course, everything was manicured, short grass for the fairways and all that. The year we came back after it was sold, it had already grown up so fast, it was inconceivable that it had been a golf course. The transformation of the Wildflower Golf Course into the preserve was the Lemon Bay Conservancy's answer to finding use for the land. Now the Conservancy's job is to undo everything that went into making it alluring for golfers. Wildflower closed in 2006. Golf courses around the country began closing at an accelerated rate that year in what the National Golf Foundation calls the start of a market correction. That correction is ongoing. In 2013, the foundation reported 157 golf courses nationwide closed. Only 14 opened that year. The Conservancy acquired the land in 2010. By then, the golf course had not been maintained for about four years and invasive plants were growing wild. Volunteers work twice a week to fight these plants. But naturalist Bob Cooper says one golf course design element actually makes it harder for the plants to take over, golf mounds. Usually where you have a tee or a green, because they manicured it and they brought it up from the soil, removed from the water hazards and things like that, it's very dry and it doesn't uh, let some of the plants come in that would come in more in the wet areas. The Brazilian pepper comes into more of the, the wet areas and the uh, salt bush, which is a native species, comes in on the drier areas. While these man-made mounds keep the invasive plants at bay, some of the other methods used to keep it looking pristine have altered the environment. When the Conservancy acquired the land, it only had to look at one pond that was covered in a thick green layer of a tiny, tiny plant called duckweed to see there might be a problem. 
Lemon Bay Conservancy Director Eva Ferner says duckweed makes it harder for life to thrive in the pond. There's a low oxygen level because there's so much um, plant life on the surface of the pond, so the fish can't survive in that pond. Water samples also revealed high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus in the creek and some of the fresh water ponds. Ferner believes these levels could be caused by the combination of fertilizers the golf course used leaching into the water mixed with the way the land was shaped. The golf course was designed so water from surrounding neighborhoods would flow onto and irrigate the course. But it brings all of this nutrient-rich water into the nearby ponds and creek, water that eventually makes its way into Lemon Bay. Fertilizers can have a lasting effect on the environment. David Guest is the head of the Florida Regional Office of Earth Justice, an international environmental law firm. He says fertilizers function as an insurance policy for operators, a way of knowing the grass will stay green. But fertilizers can stay in the soil and eventually leach into the water. So when you fertilize the golf course, it makes everything turn green. And when you fertilize the water, it turns green too, You're fertilizing water. You also will get a higher risk of a red tide outbreak. Guest says modern golf courses are smarter about using fertilizers. To fight some of the effects of the nutrient-rich water, the Conservancy is testing floating foam islands in one pond. On the island is a type of plant that, as it grows, sucks nutrients out of the pond. As for pesticides, Guest says modern golf courses use many pesticides that biodegrade quickly. But older golf courses, like this one, may have used pesticides that don't break down. Guest says pesticides can bioaccumulate, meaning their toxic effects don't go away when consumed, which can work their way up the food chain. When you get to high predators, uh, like, you know, predator fish, tarpons, and things of that sort, it can really build up to the point where it, it's a problem. A spokesperson with the Southwest Florida Water Management District, which will work with the Conservancy on an upcoming project at the preserve, says the district would only test for pesticides if it believes the site is contaminated. It has no plans to test. The Southwest Florida Water Management District will work with the Conservancy to change the physical shape of the land. We'll look at how do we need to recontour the land and the wetlands so that the water basically runs through a lot more plant life and surface waters before it hits the bay and those plants will help it filter the nutrients out before it gets out into the to the actual bay system. Ferner hopes to have most of the invasive plant species removed from the property in about a year and a half. From there, it's just maintenance. According to the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, up to 20 percent of Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Some 68,000 veterans live in Lee County alone, and that number is expected to increase as more soldiers return home. With long wait times for appointments at the VA, finding psychiatric help poses a challenge for many. But as WGCU's John Davis reports, one North Fort Myers couple offers an alternative, unique treatment through therapy with horses. Keith and Gail Doxy opened Miles Ranch in North Fort Myers on Veterans Day 2013. The rural 20-acre site has become a haven for local veterans looking for help dealing with trauma-induced PTSD through horse therapy. Equine Assisted Therapy, or EAT, is growing in acceptance but is still considered experimental. Gail is a licensed mental health counselor. She says sometimes the vets ride the horses, but that's not technically part of the treatment. The therapy itself involves doing exercises with the horses and, and, and um, perhaps building certain obstacles, things that they want to get around or get over or get through, and it'll be um, a metaphor for what they're experiencing in life. With Gail as the therapist and her husband acting as horse handler, she says they mostly don't interfere, but instead observe the veteran working with the horse and trying to manipulate the massive animal's movements. Gail says watching veterans interact with the horses can tell her more about what her patients are feeling than a traditional talk therapy session. They don't really have to verbalize if they're angry or if they're um, upset or even fearful you can see it. So it's much easier for a therapist to be able to work with them rather than sitting and asking questions that they're not comfortable with. Gail says horses, particularly skittish ones, are ideal for this. Horses are hypervigilant because they're a prey animal. So they kind of have that startle response. Uh, they're very sensitive in nature. So they're going to um, be able to mimic 
like um, per se people that have post-traumatic stress disorder. Come here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna get some apples and then you guys are gonna come running right after me, aren't you? You're gonna love it. Retired U.S. Army Staff Sergeant and Purple Heart recipient Bobby Miniachi is one of the handful of vets who visit Miles Ranch for EAT treatment. The 32-year-old Iraq War veteran says for him, working with the horses helps harness another form of communication. No matter what you say to them, they don't understand. You have to learn how to control your gestures. And that's uh, one of the things that you have to relearn. Like with having push my chest sort of one of the things that kind of can come with it is getting frustrated really easily or get angry really easily or getting anxious. And you can't do that with the horses. You have to be calm. It's like retraining yourself how to be around people through an animal. Miniachi was deployed to Iraq in March of 2007, where he did one of the most dangerous jobs. When I was in Iraq, I was doing what was called route clearance. You're clearing the route for the infantry behind us. So we would go out and we would look for roadside bombs. And so while everyone else was trying to avoid them, we were out there looking for them. And, but unfortunately, it, it's not the most easy job. And you had to do it at night as well. And we were constantly out there at least 12 hours a day for our platoon and then the other platoon would try to take over the other 12 hours. And unfortunately, the best way to find them is when they blow up next to you. Just four months in, Miniachi took a sniper bullet to his right leg. The wound still hurts, but it was the PTSD diagnosis that kept him from returning to the Army. One of the biggest challenges is an overwhelming sense of worthlessness. I went from being the guy in charge, who, who I was the leader of, of these men, to now uh, I'm, I can't get a job, you know. I had one job in the past six years and it was delivering pizza. And I couldn't even do that. You know, I got, I got frustrated one day and I flew off the handle. Miniachi says the horse therapy and even just working on the ranch has helped him overcome that sense of not having a purpose. When I come out here, I never have that feeling. Here, I can come out and do what I can do. I have a purpose and if I can't get it finished, I, I'm not fired, you know. Uh, I can come back and, you know, do, just do what I can. There's no judgment. Just as Miles Ranch helps veterans overcome personal trauma, the inspiration for the ranch itself was born out of personal tragedy. Following in his father's footsteps, Miles Doxey joined the Air Force at 17, but just weeks before basic training in 2006, he was killed in a car accident. Keith Doxey says Miles' horse gave them the idea. We were searching for something that would, uh, you know, pay homage to him, and and um, he used to have, well, he has uh, Marshall, his horse, and he used to go out to the horse and um, when he needed to collect his thoughts, and it was a good thing for him, so we know that it always uh, made him feel good. Keith says that's what led them to begin an equine-assisted therapy program. They call it the Miles of Smiles Foundation. It's free. Right now, the Doxies have two horses and eventually hope to have up to 10. Meanwhile, Iraq War veteran Miniachi says he's healed enough to be living full-time with his six-year-old daughter. They both come to love working with horses. Florida's beaches will soon be available for the entire world to see via Google Earth. The state's tourism marketing arm, Visit Florida, has teamed with the internet giant using its trekking technology to upload continuous images of what it calls the most beautiful beaches in the world. WGCU's Valerie Alker caught up with a trekker at Cedar Key Beach. Before an up-close look at Florida's beaches can become a click away on Google, teams such as Sean McGeever and David DeLong are on the ground capturing images of the coast. The pair started their West Coast trek in Cedar Key, walking south. They covered about 10 miles every day. Each day starts just after sunrise. McGeever and DeLong go through a checklist. They make sure the lenses of their cameras are clean, they have new batteries, and they recorded their GPS coordinates. Water and sunscreen are also on the list. Trekking requires not only attention to detail, but physical endurance. Sand can be pretty deep. I've had times where I've stepped in the sand and it's gone up to my knees and it's kind of like, oh, what am I doing out here? Like, it's, it's tough sometimes. The equipment weighs about 45 pounds and fits into a backpack. 
The green globe on top of the pole is about the size of a soccer ball. Inside are 15 lenses capturing a full view of the beach. The cameras record a new image every two and a half seconds. They're downloaded in California where Google technicians align the imagery and stitch the images together, creating a 360 degree panorama. Together, DeLong and McGeever have photographed about 500 miles of Florida's beaches step by step. McGeever says his favorite beach was on Florida's space coast. Canaveral was hard to walk, but it was a state park and it's beautiful, beautiful water, beautiful sand. It's great. And the worst? Also Canaveral, because they had uh, nudists at the end of their beach and I had never been exposed to nudists before, but uh, I don't think I'll be going back anytime soon. We blur out uh, any uh, extremities. Much of the project's cost is funded by a grant Visit Florida received from BP. Jack Wirt is the executive director of Naples Marco Island Everglades Convention and Visitors Bureau. He says he's thrilled with the promotional prospects. Well, it was very exciting to hear that, uh, that Google was going to uh, do the, the walking trek, uh, all uh, 800 miles of our beaches here in Florida. It really was uh, a great opportunity for us to showcase what we have uh, to the public. And uh, people want to see pictures. They want to see what the place really looks like. Potential visitors can also take a top-down look at how the coast has changed from 1984 to 2012 with the Google Earth Engine. A Google Earth Engine search for beaches such as Captiva and Bonita Beach show the ebb and flow of sand erosion and renourishment along the coast. Brian Wimmer is enjoying his first day of vacation at the beach. He's visiting from West Virginia. He said he would have used Google Earth to check out the beaches beforehand. I spent two weeks planning this trip, so any reference would have been helpful. At the project's completion, two teams of trekkers had mapped 850 miles of Florida's shoreline. A second team charted the Panhandle beaches. Two speedways in Bradenton and Punta Gorda hope to revitalize short track racing in southwest Florida. A short track is shorter than a mile. The lanes of the tracks may be limited, but racing comes with a price. WGCU's Topher 4 has, has the tale of two racetracks. It's the first race day at the Full Throttle Speedway in Bradenton. In the pits behind the track, drivers and their teams prepare cars for the night's features. If they make it to the feature event, they get some money. The biggest prize goes to the racer with the best time. But these racers are competing in a sport that's becoming more expensive for them, as racetrack owners are also figuring out ways to sustain their businesses. 58-year-old Clyde Cole has been racing for about 28 years. He retired once, but returned last year. It took Cole two years to build the car he's racing today. Its biggest cost is the engine, which accounts for 15,000 of what can be up to a $38,000 price tag. He says times have changed. It used to be you could go to a salvage yard, junkyard, whatever you want to call it, and get parts. They don't have the parts at them places anymore because they crush cars and scrap them. Cole's biggest ongoing expense is tires. He says a night of racing can cost him $750. Cole calls full throttle his home track. Last year, Mike Chase bought the 65 acres the track sits on for $1.3 million. He asked business partner Kevin Williams to help promote and operate the track. From the time they bought the track until opening day, the owners made several repairs, including repaving the track and installing benches. On race night, Williams was dealing with power outages. So Mother Nature sort of uh, has, has thrown a wrench in a few things tonight, but we worked through it, got some wiring done, we got lights going and everything like that, but we had a bad electrical storm Thursday night and uh, it blew up some of our lighting and actually split one of our poles in the infield, uh, blew the whole top out of it, but uh, we've worked through that. Months later, Williams left the track and Chase became a silent partner. Full Throttle then changed its name to the DeSoto Speedway. Former co-owner Kevin Williams had also run the Punta Gorda Speedway. Chase was an investor there. Williams left that track after the leaseholder, the Charlotte County Airport Authority, raised the rent. For a time, the Punta Gorda Speedway sat barren. Last summer, yard workers began preparing the track for its new director, Jamie Hazy. Hazy moved with his family from Indiana to operate the track and renamed it the Three Palm Speedway. The track's grand opening is in August. Hazy wants to use social media as a draw. One of his sons plans to quickly post video recaps on Facebook. We're going to have GoPro cameras around the track, and when something happens, it's a wireless feed right into his computer. He'll have it up on Facebook within a couple minutes. 
But there is a price tag attached to getting things back up and running here. Hazi's self-financed rent is $6,400 a month. There will also be repairs, including a new fence and bleachers. That's in addition to the $2 million liability insurance policy. Accidents do happen. On Full Throttle's grand opening last year, a part in Jeff Steiner's car broke, sending him head first into a wall at 115 miles an hour. His injuries included a broken neck and two punctured lungs. The crash would take Steiner out of racing and into a temporary large neck brace kept in place by holes screwed into his head. His hospital bill came to about $200,000. Despite the high cost, Steiner hopes to race again. We are going to go out for a practice night, and I'm going to see if I can still do it. Um, if I can still do it, if my wife can handle watching it again, we will be back at a racetrack. With drivers like Steiner still willing to race, the DeSoto Speedway and the Three Palms Speedway will be competing with each other to become the premier short track in southwest Florida. Thanks for watching Gulf Coast Life. I'm Amy Tardif. For the latest news from around Florida, visit WGCUNews.org. Have a great day.